Our Bible reading today comes from the book of Joshua, chapter 14, and I'm reading verses 6 to 13. A delegation from the tribe of Judah, led by Caleb, son of Jephana, the Kenizzite, came to Joshua in Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, Remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report, but my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. So that day Moses solemnly promised me, the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land and that of your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Now, as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise, even while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Today I am 85 years old. I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey, and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me this hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as scouts we found the descendants of Anak living there in great ward towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land, just as the Lord said. So Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephana, and gave Hebron to him as his portion of land. I'm an ideas man. And over the years, I've had some crackers. And I want to tell you just a couple before we move on, just to give you the caliber of ideas we're talking here. I remember once when we uh, were newlyweds, and we moved into our first little place, moved out of mum and dad's. And we started that process, you know, where you're going through and acquiring things that you need, that you didn't need when you lived with mum and dad, right? Like fridges and washing machines and things like that. Well, I remember one day I was in Bunnings, love Bunnings. Bright needs Bunnings. And, okay, I'll leave that. (laughs) And we were, uh, yeah, I was in Bunnings and um, I'm wandering around And I knew that Bianca would love a clothes dryer, right? But they're like six, seven hundred bucks. And for me, I was like, that's more a luxury item, right? It's not really what I classed as a man at boo, oh dear. (laughs) Only took nine weeks to get booed. Wow, I can edit that out. (laughs) Ha ha. I thought it's a bit of a luxury item, you know? It's not, okay, come on. It's not on the same level as fridge, right? In terms of necessity. Thank you, I've won them back. But, <laughs> but I knew that Bianca would love one. But I wasn't all that keen on the money. And I was in Bunnings, and lo and behold, what I should find at 90% discount because of a broken foot on its stand or something... <clears throat> was not a dryer, it was something even better. It was a giant industrial warehouse fan. I was like, who needs a dryer when I can get this? And so I bought it and I took it home and I set up our clothes horse with the wet laundry in front of this thing that was honestly like nearly two metres wide. I could barely move it on my own. And I fired it up and boom. Now not boom as in ta-da, it worked. Boom as in crash when the whole clothes horse literally flew about four metres into the other side of the room, into the wall and put a hole in it. This thing was so powerful. Like it was next level. Now, I will say that I, uh, I did manage to perfect the craft of drying clothes with an industrial warehouse fan. But there was some little knacks. For instance, I had to put about 20 kilos of concrete blocks on the clothes horse to keep it in place. And every item needed about 20 pegs so they didn't fly away in this gale force cyclone. 
I mean, what a great idea, right? No, I'm seeing lots of heads this way. Bianca loved it. Can't you imagine? She loved it. <clears throat> Not. It was a bit tricky, I admit, because there was only certain times that I could dry clothes. I couldn't dry clothes when she was trying to watch, t watch TV because this thing was like... Rah! I couldn't dry clothes when someone came over for coffee. In fact, I couldn't even dry clothes after about 8 o'clock at night because we got noise complaints. <laughs> what a great idea. What about this one? When I was in year 9, I... One of my spiritual gifts that you guys maybe aren't quite yet to know, but one of my spiritual gifts, particularly when it comes to things that I don't care about, like English essays, is procrastinating. Like, I'm just gifted in this, right? And I remember in year nine, I had to do this English essay, and it was a particular type of English essay called an instructional essay. Right, where you write an essay about you know, how to bake a cake or how you would ride a bike or whatever. And I remember the night before this thing was due thinking, oh, what am I going to write for this essay? And as I'm staring into the abyss of the desktop um, computer, the family computer that all us kids shared, I'm the baby, all of a sudden I saw this file on the desktop that was called Lauren Hornby underscore year 12 rollerblading essay underscore final draft. You see, I had a sister who had finished year 12 the year before. And lo and behold, in year 12, she had written an instructional essay on rollerblading. And I was like, oh my gosh, here we go. Now, I know what you're thinking, and no, I'm not a cheat, so I didn't just hand in her essay and pretend it was mine. I'm a problem solver. So what I did do, as I was researching our school's plagiarism laws, I noted that in the policy on our school's website, it talked about not having exact sentences about something of the same topic. So I had this cracker of an idea. In an effort to make sure that I was talking about a new topic and to make sure that there was technically no exact sentences, I had this brilliant idea to write an instructional essay about skateboarding. Are you following me? I couldn't believe how perfect this was, right? I literally only had to change one word every time I saw it in her essay and I was done. Like sentences like this, she wrote this, not me. When preparing to rollerblade, it is a great idea to consider protective gear like helmet, knee pads and elbow pads. Simply became, when preparing to skateboard, it is a great idea to consider protective gear like helmet, knee pad, and elbow pads. Even complex sentences like when rollerblading, make sure one foot is in front of the other and you have your weight evenly distributed between your feet was simply changed with one word. What a great idea, right? I can see all the creative procrastinators going, yeah, touche, Matt. <laughs> And then I can see the rest of you frowning like, doesn't sound very ethical, Matt. <laughs> Don't worry, I was busted. Well, kind of. You see, my English teacher knew there's no way I wrote this thing. Like, it was way too good for me. And so she'd got onto Google and she'd, you know, put in chunks of my essay to see if any matches would come up. And none would come up. She was convinced I'd stolen it off the internet. But I hadn't. And it wasn't until parent-teacher interview that I'm sitting down with this teacher and my mum and she brings it up and mum all of a sudden realises what's going on and so she calmly says to the teacher, I can assure Matthew did not take this off the internet but he did get some help from his sister, didn't he, Matt? And that was that. You see, I'm an ideas man. And I remember one day I'm pitching one of my cracking ideas to my dad. 
Now, this one was always going to be difficult because it involved asking him for a large sum of money. But, hey, I thought I'd give it a crack. Well, it didn't take long for me to realise that this wasn't really going anywhere. And so to save myself the lecture about being a good steward of my money, I decided to wave the white flag and I just kind of got off the couch from where I was and began to leave the room. And as I did, I kind of huffed this rhetorical question as my outro to the conversation, which was, well, haven't you ever had some crazy idea, Dad, or some dream that you wanted to chase? And like I said, it was a rhetorical question. I wasn't expecting an answer. I certainly wasn't expecting the answer that came, which was yes. I said, yes? You see, my dad is a lot of things, right? He's very smart. He's an incredibly hard worker. He's not a procrastinator like me, thanks, Mum. But out there, or risk-taker, are definitely not the sorts of words you would describe my dad with. And so I said out of curiosity, I said, well, what was this idea then, Dad? And he began to kind of tell me about it, and I was pretty impressed. I said, well, why am I not the beneficiary of this great idea? Like, what happened? And he said, well, you four kids happened. That's what happened. All the parents nod. But you know what I realised? I realised, actually, that nothing had happened other than life. Life had happened. And I wonder for yourself, if you ever look back and ask yourself, whatever happened to that kid that was going to be the next Prime Minister? Or whatever happened to that kid that was going to win Wimbledon? Or that was going to find the cure of cancer? Or that fervent teenager that was going to pray for every single kid in your school till they all knew Jesus? Why is it... That in general, as we get older, we tend to dream smaller. Why is it that as we mature, we tend to lose our edge? We tend to tone down our passion, our wildness. We allow ourselves to be tame, especially in our faith. I'm too old to get up early, we say to ourselves to pray. Or fasting, mm, sounds a bit over the top. That sounds a bit legalistic. God knows I love him. I don't need to strive. You know, I looked up the meaning for the word tame and this is what it says. It says to make less powerful and easier to control. To subdue, to water down or to make sensible. And when I consider, as Paul says, that our fight isn't against flesh and blood, it's against the spiritual world. When I consider that as participants of the kingdom of God, we're called to stand firm against the enemy and its kingdom. What more effective strategy could the enemy hope for than a bunch of Christians that aren't very powerful that are easy to control, easy to subdue, that are sensible. What's more, when I read my Bible, I don't know about you, I read about an over-the-top God. I read about a God who's outrageous, who's totally wild, totally untamed. I certainly don't encounter a tame God. A half-hearted God, a watered-down God, a sensible God. I mean, what was sensible, think about it, about God sending Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to die on a cross for broken humanity? A humanity that honestly, in a large part, were going to refuse his offer of salvation anyway. What's sensible about that? What's sensible about Jesus on the cross for the very people that are abusing him and crucifying him that he would utter to the Father, Father, forgive them. What's sensible about leaving the 99 to pursue the one? When would we ever adopt that in our business strategies, right? 
You see, I don't think we serve a sensible or a tame God. In fact, of all the things I reckon God is concerned about in our faith journey, I think resisting being tame is at the top of the list. And so this morning, I want to look at this idea about resisting being tamed. In the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, John is writing a prophetic message that Jesus wants to give to seven churches in Asia Minor. And to each church, Jesus provides a a bit of a report card. A couple of things that they're doing well and a couple of things that they're not, right? Well, to the church in Laodicea, he writes, and it's the only church that doesn't get any positive affirmation on their report card. Not a good start, right? You see, Jesus seems to be so caught up about something that they're doing, something that's not okay, that he devotes his whole monologue to address. And what's most surprising is what it is that they're doing that's not okay. You see, it's not idolatry. It's not adultery. It's not false teaching or one of the other big ones. Listen to what it is, verse 16. But since you are lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus is saying... Because you're so watered down, because you're so blasé about your faith, so indifferent, so subdued, so tamed by the things of this world and the culture that surrounds you, I literally can't stomach you. Isn't that a pretty harsh message? And this isn't a one-off suggestion though. And it's not the only time it occurs. All throughout the New Testament, we witness a radical call to discipleship, don't we? Where Jesus says, no, 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 leave everything and follow me. There's no half-heartedness about the radical call of discipleship that he invites people into. And in Matthew 5, some very well-known words, Jesus says this. You are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it loses its saltiness, its flavor? Can you be made salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled as worthless. You see, Jesus isn't really giving much middle ground here. In fact, he's giving no middle ground. He's saying, don't be lukewarm. He's saying, either be potent in your faith, Totally salty, totally full of flavour in your discipleship journey. Or you're not much used to the kingdom. In fact, you're kind of worthless. Kind of vomit out of my mouth worthless. And I know that sounds like a harsh reality and yet it's reality. You know, church, I believe this morning that God is calling us to resist being tamed. To resist allowing the values and the morals, our values and morals, to be watered down by the culture around us. To resist becoming lukewarm in the hierarchy of where we place following Jesus amongst a plethora of really enjoyable things in a life in bright. To resist losing our potency as men and women of faith to, lose, to resist losing our passion for actually becoming more like Jesus. You know, church, this isn't a game. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be tame. I want to be on fire. I want to be potent. I want to be genuinely more like Christ tomorrow than I was today. And you know what? I want to lead a faith community that pines for the same thing, amen? We have to resist being tamed. And there are two things I think that can help on our journey of beginning to resist being tamed. And they're these. The convictions that we hold 
and the courage that we have. Sorry, I don't have slides for you today. Just have to focus on my beautiful face. <laughs> have you ever heard the phrase, oh, she's got no shame? Maybe to do with an item of clothing she's wearing or not wearing. Or have you heard the phrase, oh, he's got no shame? Usually more a narcissistic thing when it comes to blokes and ego and bravado. It may surprise you, I'm sure it does, given how quiet and meek I am, that this is a phrase I have heard before in my life, particularly when I share about how me and Bianca first got together. You see, it was a New Year's Eve party in Sydney, and a Christian New Year's Eve party, just qualifying. And uh, we, you know, we were chitty chatting, a little bit of flirty, but probably only about on, you know, on a two on the scale of one to ten. And as we're chatting, I find out that she's got a boyfriend. I was like, hmm, that's a little bit of a roadblock. Nothing too crucial, you know, I can handle this, but a little bit of a setback. And I say to her, well, where is this guy then? You know, if he loves you so much, why is he not spending what for a lot of young people is a relatively important day on the calendar, right? Why isn't he spending it with you? Oh, no, I don't know. No, 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 no. So already I don't like this guy at all. And I don't know why, but I happen to be holding Bianca's phone in my hand. Maybe she's shown me a picture or a video or something. And lo and behold, who should call if not this punk boyfriend that I don't like? And I don't know why I didn't just hand the phone back to her. That would make sense. Her phone. Instead, I just kind of picked it up and started talking. You see, I often talk before I think. And the problem is this, right? I do my best work when I don't think and I just talk, but I also do my worst work when I think and don't talk. So I answer this phone, and on the other end of the phone, the very first thing I hear is, I cannot describe a more condescending, belittling tone, and I just hear this, Hi, babe. Like it was such a hassle to ring the love of his life. And I already don't like this guy. And so I'm like, this is not your babe. It's Bianca's new boyfriend. And hung up. <laughs> I told you, I do my best and worst work when I don't think. And as it kind of my brain caught up with my mouth, I kind of looked at her phone. I was like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. And so I slowly looked up to face the music. And I couldn't believe that, yes, I'll be transparent. There was a little bit of, what did you just do? But there was a lot of, what did you just do? And I was like, hang on, I'm in. <laughs> like, she's not freaking out. And I just declared myself as her new boyfriend. Most girls would freak out at that. So I was like, I'm in. And so I took the two up to like a ten. And I was like, all right, time to get active with my total annihilation of this guy. I'm going to totally undermine this guy and try and convince her that she can do way better than this punk. And so I launched into a speech. And I wish I could tell you I was embellishing, but this is literally verbatim. I said this. I said, <clears throat> Bianca, you don't need... I lose a boyfriend like that. You need a man. I legit said this. Who will climb to the highest of mountains for you. It doesn't get less cringeworthy the more I tell this story. Who will swim to the depths of the ocean for you. Who will fight through the fiercest of storms for you. Just so you know he loves you. That's the man you need. Oh, I know, it's so bad. <laughs> you see, I had no shame in pursuing Bianca so forwardly. I had no shame saying the things I did, as corny as they were. Oh my gosh, they were corny. Because of the convictions I had. 
You see, I had a deep and unshakable conviction that this was the most beautiful and wonderful girl I had ever seen. And there was no one and nothing that was going to water my efforts to chase her. Nothing. You see, one of the most powerful ways we resist being tamed, we resist being watered down is through the convictions that we hold. Look back at our passage about Caleb. Other than Joshua, who's now the leader of Israel, Caleb is the only bloke that when they were sent, Israel sent a little party of 12 spies to check out the promised land. He was, other than Joshua, the only guy that brings back a favorable report. Remember the story? He comes back and says, yes, we can take it. With God's help, we can take it. However, because of Israel's corporate disbelief, Caleb, like the rest of them, is forced to go into 40 years of wandering around the wilderness because Israel as a whole thought that they couldn't take it. And after 40 years, as Israel began to start driving out the inhabitants of the promised land, this is what Caleb says to Joshua. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report, but my brothers who went before me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. So that day, Moses solemnly promised me, the land of Canaan, on which you were just walking, will be your grant of land and that of your descendants forever. Because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Now... As you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise. Even while Israel wandered in the wilderness, today I am 85 years old. Who's 85? Don't put your hand up because you probably can't. That was low. Sorry. That was low. No, we've got awesome, uh, very virulent. Anyway, I'll just stop. He says, <laughs> wow, see what I tell you, my worst work when I don't think. Anyway, he said, I was 85 years old. I am as strong now as uh, w- when uh, Moses sent me out on that journey. And I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised. Can you hear the conviction in Caleb's voice? Give me my land. 45 years is a long time to wait, right? I am sure that there were moments that he battled doubt and disbelief. And yet, unlike the whole of his generation, he remains potent. He withstands capitulating to the comfort and the ease of being lukewarm. Becoming indifferent and tamed by the culture that completely surrounds him. Could you imagine every time he's hanging out with the boys, every time he participates in any communal activity, there he's forced to rub up against the lukewarm, the indifferent, the watered down faith of his nation. There he's forced to endure the shame, the alienation of believing something completely contrary to popular belief. And yet, for 45 years, he resists being tamed. Refuses to quit believing God's promises is true. Refuses because he has a conviction. A conviction that God's promises are yes and amen. That God was for him, that God is faithful. Amen? Amen. You know, the first step in resisting being tamed, resisting cultural pressure, family pressure, peer pressure, resisting living a mediocre, watered down life of faith, the type of faith journey Jesus can't stomach, starts 
with the convictions we hold and having no shame about holding them. The second way we resist being tamed isn't just by the convictions that we hold, but it's through the courage that we have. You know, one of my absolute favorite parts of this story about Caleb isn't just the total zeal and passion that he shows for resisting being tamed, but it's his kingdom bravado. It's his swagger and his faith in God. I love it. Look at verse 11. It says this. Today I am 85 years old. I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on the journey and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. Like he is backing himself at 85, yeah? You will remember, listen to this, that as scouts, we found the descendants of Anak living there in great walled towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land just as the Lord said. You know what's significant about this? Caleb isn't asking when he approaches Joshua in this conversation. He's not asking for any portion of the promised land. He's asking for the best portion of the promised land. But do you know what else he's asking for? He's asking for the portion that will unequivocally be the hardest to conquer. He's not asking for the easy road. He is asking for the absolute hardest road. Caleb says in verse 14, you remember that as scouts we found the descendants of Anak living there in great walled towns. Caleb reminds Joshua that the descendants of Anak were in the land that he's asking for. And so the question we're left wondering is, who were the descendants of Anak, right? Well, the descendants of Anak were giants. They were the very people that historians said that Goliath descended from. You know, 10 feet tall, absolute units. Like a nightmare for armies. And yet knowing that this nation not only had fortified city walls, unlike most of the other nations, they also legitimately had the most powerful and brutal soldiers in the whole of the land, and they would by far be the hardest to conquer. And yet Caleb says, give me this land. What courage. What courage. And that's the second way that we resist being tamed. You see, it's not enough to just have strong convictions. We have to have the courage that acts on them. Amen? You know, I feel like courage is one of those things that is often misunderstood in our culture. You know, so many people come up to me, and you can come up to me and say this. I won't use it in a sermon illustration. And they often tell me, I don't feel very courageous, Matt. I feel very anxious. Could you pray for me that I'd have courage? And I appreciate the sentiment, right? But courage isn't a chemical. It's not a hormone that you build up in your system, right? It's not this thing that you can acquire more and more of, per se. It's a mental disposition. It's a heart attitude. It's the willingness, listen to this, to fight, the willingness to be wild, the willingness to be outrageous or potent, despite knowing full well that there are challenges, there are difficulties that lay ahead. It's the choice to fight, despite the presence of real fear and real anxiety. You know, and the most important thing about courage is that the only way, hear me, the only way we become more courageous is by practicing courage. We don't become more courageous by praying more or by wishful thinking or by motivational pep talks. It's by practicing courage. You know, Aristotle once said this. Whatever we learn to do, we learn by actually doing it. 
Men come to be builders, for instance, by building. And harp players by playing the harp. In the same way, by doing just acts, we come to be just. By doing self-controlled acts, we come to be self-controlled. And by doing brave acts, we come to be brave. See, the point is this. The only way we become courageous is by practicing being courageous. By acting out of what we know to be true, despite what we know we feel. The reality is this. There are going to be moments in your life when you don't feel like you can keep going. There are going to be moments when you don't feel like being generous. There are going to be moments when you don't feel like speaking up about your faith at work. Or when you don't feel like getting up early to go to prayer meeting. Or when you don't feel like prioritizing reading your Bible. Or being intentional about making sure you're in church or home group. But like Caleb, if we're going to resist being tamed, resist becoming lukewarm in our potency and faith in Christ, then we have to practice acts of courage. Practice choosing to keep fighting in spite of the real anxiety and real fear or doubt, the real discouragement, the real pain, the real sacrifice that we're going to be faced with. We have to resist being tamed, not just through the convictions that we hold, but through the courage that we have, yeah? Amen. You know, when Zach was two, ads, you can come up. When Zach was two, and kind of just learning to speak and stuff, you know what a two-year-old's like. I remember we got a, a new compassion child. Uh, we supported a couple of compassion childs, and one of the ones that we'd supported for like... 18 years or something, had eventually graduated from the program. And so we were sent a new one. And I remember we got this little photo of him and we popped him up on the fridge and we started talking to Zach about Shiro. His name was Shiro. We said, hey, buddy, this is Shiro. And we're going to pop him on our fridge because we're going to remember to pray for him because Shiro doesn't really have much money. Shiro doesn't really have the sorts of things that we have here in this country. And I never forget what he said when I said Shiro doesn't really have much money. He went and found his piggy bank, which was the shape of a pig that he called Piggy, funnily enough. With outstretched arms, he just said, Daddy, Shiro can have everything that's in Piggy. Like it was just so, it was so obvious for him. This over the top, this wild sense that as adults, we slowly, oh, well, is that sensible? Is that practical? Is that reasonable? Daddy, Shiro can just have everything in my piggy. You know, I really believe this morning that that's the heart that God is calling us as a church to adopt. A heart that says, God, you can have everything in my piggy. When I'm in worship, you can have everything in my piggy, God. When I'm generous, you can have everything in my piggy. When I'm at work and I want to be a servant, God, you can have everything in my piggy. When I prioritize reading the Bible, when I prioritize being intentional about my discipleship and not blaming it on Netflix or not saying that I'm too busy or I don't have enough time, God, you can have everything in my piggy. And my prayer this morning is that we would be people that aren't tamed, that aren't subdued, that aren't easy to controlled and watered down because we say, God, you can have everything in my pity. My prayer this morning, as we leave this place, would you respond in your heart to the call that God's putting right now in your heart in a particular area of your life to give Him everything in your piggy? 
that you would take seriously this fight we're called to, to resist being tamed through the convictions that you hold and through the courage that you have. Amen. Let's pray.